Hallelujah. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, gentlemen. It is good to see you this morning. Uh, if you didn't real recognize it as you walked in on the back table where our communion elements, we will be receiving communion in just a little bit towards the end of the service. Those of you who are participating on Facebook, you can go ahead and get you some saltine crackers, uh, get you some uh, apple juice, grape juice, whatever kind of juice you might have at the house, and uh, participate with us uh, in communion in just a little bit. Amen couple of announcements this morning. We had a little uh, opportunity with our water. Uh, I believe it's corrected. Uh, did you turn it back on? Okay. So uh, we, we are having some main line water problems. We had a leak under the slab. Uh, that will be taken care of this week. And so uh, if you go into the restroom and it's a little damp, just be careful. I believe it'll be okay. Uh, but we're going to turn the water off right after service uh, so that it doesn't continue. The other thing is that uh, we, we had it on the big screen. Uh, on Father's Day weekend, June 19th and 20th, we're going to have a bake sale for our youth group. Our uh, young people are going to be going to a youth camp in Dry, dry, dry Creek, Dry Grouch, Dry something, uh, up around Lake Charles area. There's a, a, a campground there. So our youth, along with Hope Campus Youth, and then another church in Kinder called Grand Church, is a personal friend of mine, the pastor's a Rama graduate. Our three groups are going to be renting the whole facility for that weekend. Uh, for, for the weekend in August, I believe it's the uh, middle of August, uh, August, uh, uh, I want to say 2nd, 3rd, 4th in that neighborhood, but uh, we'll, more information will be coming. But we're, we're endeavoring to let our kids earn their way to camp. And so we're having a bake sale. Two things you can do for the bake sale. If you are a baker, now a, a female is still called a baker today's culture? I, I, I don't know. I'm just asking. Uh, it's not a bake it, a bake est, or, 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 you know, anyway. Um, so if you are a baker and you like to bake, and then you go ahead and contact Miss Carla Broussard. Let her know you'll be making uh, uh, brownies, cookies, uh, pies, cake, or something. Let her know what you'll be making, and then uh, bring it on the uh, Saturday afternoon, because we're going to do this Saturday evening after the Saturday evening service, along with the Sunday morning uh, and, and so bring enough because one of the gentlemen said last night that he was going to bring his bank account and he'll buy out the table so I, I don't know if he was serious or not uh, but in case bring some stuff on Sunday morning just in case he does buy it all on Saturday night uh, and then the, uh, the next thing is you can bake some stuff and bring uh, so that uh, people can purchase it and then we ask you to buy something uh, you can buy your own stuff if you'd like. Uh, if you're not sure what, what anybody else's stuff will taste like, but you like yours, then you can buy your own if you'd like to do that. Amen? Hallelujah. So as you walked in, most of you put your tithes and offerings in the offering receptacle. Thank you for doing that. The Lord will bless you immensely. Those of you who are watching by Facebook can participate by those three ways on the bottom left hand of your screen. Let's just go ahead and pray over our offering. Say this with me. Father, this is my investment in the kingdom of heaven so that Living Glory Church can fulfill its divine ministry. Your word says that when we sow a seed, we can expect a harvest. Father, my harvest is coming in pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I will never have a bill I cannot pay. I'll never have a need that you will not meet according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Well, um, I had intended to preach this message last week, but the Lord did some adjustments on the direction for last week being the Memorial Day weekend. Uh, the Lord had me address that and, and, and preach a message along those lines. So I got the permission by the Holy Spirit to start that's the next this series this week. Uh, not to complicate things, but the week before that was Pentecost. And you know, most of the time in the church world, Pentecost goes almost unnoticed, almost unmentioned. 
there's very few churches that will acknowledge that Pentecost Sunday. And so we did and spent some time on the fact that it is essential for the power, the growth, the ministry, the strength of the church to have the Holy Spirit operative and working in the church. Uh, without the Holy Spirit, the church is nothing more than a, a, a human institution. Without the Holy Spirit, the church is a simply a social club that meets once or twice a week and we uh, uh, greet each other, uh, give a little money, hear a little sermonette, and then we go home. Uh, we need the Holy Spirit, amen, uh, in our services, and you need the Holy Spirit in your life. And so we're going to start a series on how to make room for the Holy Spirit, the necessity to make room for the Holy Spirit in your life. I don't know about you, but my life is busy. I believe that your life is as busy as mine. Perhaps some of you are even busier than I am. But even the, the busier we are, the more important it is for us to make room for the Holy Spirit. The busier we are, the more we have to do, the more important it is for us to flow and know that the Holy Spirit is working in our life. Amen? In uh, John chapter 14, you can turn there if you'd like, and we're going to start with verse number 16. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. This is his last supper discourse. And he says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and then he says, and he will be in you. Now, he gives the word helper. Some translations use the word comforter. Another translation uses the word parakletos. Parakletos is the Greek word for helper. If I have a helper that comes to work with me, and has some experience in a specific area. And I have him come and he is supposed to be my helper and I'm having him work with me, but I refuse to let him touch my tools. I refuse to let him use my paint rollers. No, 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 you can't use my spray gun. Uh, I, I'm going to use the spray gun. Uh, and, and so uh, he's simply standing there and he's getting paid to do nothing. Well, that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense with it. Uh, I remember back when we were in Tulsa, I had a, a, a painter friend of mine from the Northwest, uh, Steve Hunt. Uh, sometimes he watches because his service is two hours behind ours. Hey, Steve, if you're watching this morning. He was a professional painter. I was an amateur painter. And we got together. And when I would take a week to paint one house, he and I together could paint almost three houses in one week. So we got quite a bit more done, and so I learned a lot from him. And, and I learned how to use the spray gun. I learned a great deal about taping and, and masking and do all the, the things that are necessary. And I'm thankful for that. So I was his helper, and his helper Taught, he, as his helper, he taught me. And so you've got to understand that although Jesus said the Holy Spirit is our helper, he knows a whole lot more than you. He's been around a whole lot longer than you have. And so I, I think Jesus should say, the Holy Spirit is here to help us, but he's sure to help us to do the plan and, the, and, and fulfill the plan that God has for our life. And he's going to show us where the, the things are, uh, where, where the, the traps are. He's going to show us how to do the things. I can remember when, when I was back in the oil field before we ever got into the ministry. 
I'd go out, man, it was easy to pray in tongues offshore because there was so much noise, nobody could hear you. And so I was just praying in the Spirit because there's some times when I was in over my head. Have you ever been there? You just don't know what to do. And if you do the wrong thing, it's going to cost that company millions and millions and millions of dollars. And maybe your company's existence and definitely your job. And so I'd pray, Lord, I need to know what to do. And I'm telling you, there was one instance I can remember. I'm there. I'm a young man. I, I, no, j just, just so you know, I never wore new, new overalls. Never knew, wore new gloves. Because I didn't want them to know I was a worm. That I had no idea what I was doing. I wanted them to think I was an experienced, seasoned veteran. And this one particular time, I was out on the, I was out on this offshore rig, and we were having trouble down below, like 12,000 feet down. I didn't know what to do, and I just said, Holy Ghost, I need to know what to do. I need to understand what's going on down there, because they're going to come and ask me. I'm 21 years old, and these guys are in their 50s. They've done this all their life. I don't know what to do, but you know what to do. And as plain as you hear my voice, I heard my daddy's voice. And I heard my daddy say, when I ran into this trouble, this is what I did. And so when the company man came to me and said, what are we going to do? I said, this is what we're going to do. And I said exactly what I heard, my, vo my father's voice, not my biological dad's voice. That was the Holy Spirit telling me, bringing to my remembrance what my biological dad had said. And you know what? It worked. Boy, I got feathers in my cap and I just turned around and said, Holy Ghost, thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to tell you that the Holy Spirit is there for you as your helper. Now, l listen, the, the King James uh, isn't quite as clear as the Amplified. The Amplified says this, He is your strengthener. He is your comforter. He is your advocate. He is your counselor. He is your standby. And he is your intercessor. He is all of that. And he said he's not only going to be with you, he's going to be in you. Amen? And so we determine how much room we make for the Holy Spirit in our life. We make that determination. We can give him a lot of room or we can give him very little room. And so how do we determine that? One, let me say it this way. Every act of obedience and every act of disobedience has an effect on whether the Holy Spirit is allowed to maneuver in your life, allowed to function in your life. And so all of our yielding to the Holy Spirit is an endeavor to be obedient to the Holy Spirit, to let Him operate in our lives individually and corporately. It is imperative that the church world has the Holy Spirit operative in our life. Amen? Now, jump over to John 16. Turn one page, verse 7. Jesus said, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. And, and, and that was a verse of Scripture that has boggled my mind uh, for a number of years. Because he says this, he says, it's to your advantage. Now, when something's to my advantage, it means it's going to be better. Jesus' disciples never missed a meal. They never had a headache that wasn't healed. Never had an issue that he wasn't able to bring to pass. They, he, they saw miracles. They saw blind eyes open. They saw deaf ears opened. They saw lepers cleansed. They saw Jesus walking on water. It's to our advantage that you leave? Come on. That, that didn't make a whole lot of sense to them. 
But what they didn't know was that Jesus could be at only one place at one time when he was in his physical body. But when he would leave, he would come and then he would tell them, the things I did while I was here, you're going to do because the Holy Spirit's going to live on the inside of you. It's to your advantage that I go away because you will be just like me, anointed by the Spirit of God to do the same things that I have done while I've been here. So it's to your advantage. I wish he had explained it to him a little bit better than he did. Or maybe the translators didn't put it that way. We give place to the Holy Spirit or we make room to the, for the Holy Spirit in three main areas. Number one is found in Acts chapter 7 verse 51. It says that we should not resist his, in, his incoming. Acts chapter 7 verse 51 is the account where Simon, uh, Stephen is talking to the people there and he says you are stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart and your, in your ears and you always resist the Holy Spirit. Always resist his coming just as your fathers did. Listen, it's important for us not to resist the new birth. It's important not to resist the Holy Spirit coming. And Jesus said, John 16, a little bit further, that He will convict the world of sin. He will convict the world of judgment and of righteousness. It's imperative that we not resist Him. You understand that there's four uh, areas of pride that people have resisted back then and are still resisting Him today. There's four areas of pride. The first area of pride is the area of religious pride. In uh, Acts chapter 18, uh, there were those that were against Paul and Silas and Barnabas as they went. And they said, this man persuades those to not follow the law of Moses, which was not the truth. He was preaching Jesus. And, and they came against him because of their religious background, their religious belief. I don't need to get born again. I've been bo I, I was born in church. My grandpa started this church. My grandma was the, was, was the musician. My mother and father were raised. In, I was raised in church. I don't need to make Jesus the Lord of my life. And you know, if we've got that mindset then we're operating in that religious pride. And listen, uh, when we get to heaven, there will not be any banners that says this is where the Baptists meet and this is where the Catholics meet and this is where the Methodists meet and this is where the Pentecostals meet. No, they'll all be brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. And so we've got to put down our religious pride and say, listen, I'm going to follow the Word of God which says that I've got to believe in my heart that Jesus died on the cross, uh, express, his, express that with my mouth and accept Him as my my Savior. Amen. I've got to put down religious pride. The second type of pride is monetary pride or money. Uh, in Acts chapter 19, there was a man by the name of Demetrius. And he came against Paul and Silas because he was a, he was a manufacturer of religious statues. He manufactured the silver statue of the goddess Artemis. And so he said, these people are turning the world, uh, he said, upside down, but we realize they're turning the world right side up. And he said, they are doing harm to my business. In other words, when people got born again, they stopped, they stopped buying the statues of Artemis. It was hurting his business. And so uh, that, re that, that monetary pride, and there are those, even in our culture, uh, will say, you know, if I, if, if, if I get born again, I'm going to have to close my saloon. If I get born again, I'm going to have to stop this time. I'm going to have to get another job. I'm going to have to do something else. Well, my God, if you get born again, go ahead. God will give you a better job that, that you can supply and support yourself, not with something that's contrary to the Word of God. Amen? 
Whoo, might get some emails on that one. <laughs> anyway, then, then, the, then, then the third one, pride, is, is, is this thing called positional pride. In Acts chapter 26, Paul preached to King Agrippa. And King Agrippa said, In a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian. Well, what was he doing? He said, no, I, I, I've got a position of authority. I, I am somebody. I don't need to be a Christian. I don't want to be a Christian. If I'm, then, then I need to act different. I need to do different. I need to be different. No, no, I, I, I'm somebody. I don't need that place. I don't want to be a Christian because, well, I run my own business. What do I need? I've got, I've got everything. Uh, you know, there, there's monetary, there's religious, there's positional pride. But there's the third, the fourth one. It, it really has to do with individuals that hear the word. And Matt, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13, they hear the word the parable of the sower said that there was word that was sown on the wayside. Uh, and the enemy came and picked, the birds came and picked that seed. The word was heard, but it never infiltrated. It never penetrated. And Jesus made the statement because they didn't understand it. You see, there's sometimes when people might hear something one time and it just is not something they've heard before. They just don't understand it. I'm telling you this morning that if you hear something from this pulpit that you don't understand, don't just take my word for it. Go home, study it out. Get your concordance out. Get your commentaries out. Study the thing out. And if you find that I'm wrong, come call me. Come talk to me and we'll look at it together. Amen? I don't want, to, I don't want you to say, well, Pastor Carl said. No, no. Say, Jesus said. The Word of God said. Because, you know, Pastor Carl is still human. Uh, doesn't make many mistakes, but he's still human. And, and uh, praise the Lord. If you believe that, then I got some oceanfront property in Nevada for sale. Praise the Lord. Uh, and so, listen, don't resist a new birth. Don't resist drawing close to the Father. Uh, the Word says you hear the Word of God. Let the, the Holy Spirit begin to do something on the inside of you. Listen, don't resist the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, we, we, we endeavor to allow that to flow. That's the infilling of the Holy Spirit where he is more than just uh, uh, resonant in your temple, but rather has some effect in your life. Uh, it, it's being born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's where you receive your prayer language. And that's sometimes uh, such a valuable equipment and tool for the believer to be to be able to build themselves up praying in their most holy faith. Now the opposite of, of resisting is to welcome him. It's to open your heart and open your door to, to receive him and have him come in. You know, you realize that there is, a, there, there is a, an initial filling of the Holy Spirit. The minute you made Jesus the Lord of your life, the Holy Spirit came into your heart. When you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you get filled all over again. But we see it over and over and over in the Acts of the Apostles where they were filled again. They were filled again. Listen, there's, how many of you drank water yesterday? Larry, you didn't drink any water yesterday. You better drink water when you cut that grass. <laughs> how many are you going to drink some water today? We all are. Why? Because you get dry. Well, it's, it's the same thing in the realm of the Spirit. If you drank some of the Holy Spirit yesterday, you're going to have to drink some more of the Holy Spirit today. I believe if you prayed in the Spirit yesterday, you ought to pray in the Spirit of today. And if you pray in the Spirit today, you ought to pray in the Spirit tomorrow. And you pray in the Spirit every day. Amen? Why? Because there's one initial filling, but there's many refillings. Amen? And so, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, uh, Paul says, Be filled with with the Spirit. That word be is a continual action verb. 
So it should have been translated be being filled. In other words, it's not something that is just once and done. You know, like you fill a gallon of ga a gallon of uh, uh, water in a jug and you put it because you know you're going to use it one day and ten years later you find that same gallon of jug uh, underneath the cabinet way back there. Huh, wonder if that's fresh water. No, don't drink it. Because uh, it's probably not fresh water. You used it when we were going to have a hurricane back then to, to do what? You know, anyway, let's go on. Uh, and so we, we don't want to resist him. We want to welcome him. As I prepared this, when he knocks on your door through a message of the Spirit, through a message that's anointed, through a message that God has placed on the, the minister who, who you are listening to at the moment. Open your heart. Receive it. Don't say, oh, I heard that already. Because there's something that the Holy Spirit wants to teach you. Be always open to every message that you hear. When I was 13 years old, just a couple of years ago, uh, I had the opportunity to be home alone. Uh, Mom and Dad were, uh, they frequented Evangeline Downs at the time. Many of you may not remember Evangeline Downs. That's where FedEx and Amazon is right now. Amazon was a race, uh, Evangeline Down was a racetrack. They raced ponies there. Mom and dad were, well, mom went with dad. Dad was the avid pony guy. I don't think he ever rode a horse in his life, but he liked to bet on the horses. And that particular Friday night or Saturday night, I'm not sure what night it was, I was home alone. My younger sister's probably spending the night at her friends or my grandparents. And it's about 9 o'clock at night, and I heard this knock on the back door. Bang, bang, bang. Open this door, said in French. And, and, and I said, oh my goodness. Maybe not exactly what I said. I said, what am I going to do? See, I had an uncle who was about five foot nine in all directions. <laughs> and, and he, and he, he would, he would frink with a little establishment not far from our house. And when he had a little bit too much to drink, he, he was smart in that he didn't try to drive himself all the way home to Lafayette. He came to get his designated driver, my dad, who would drive him home. And mom would follow them in her car and then bring dad home. Uh, it just so happens I can't drive. I'm 13. And I'm 5 foot 8, about 110 pounds. There's no way I can do anything with this man. And he kept knocking. Open this blankety blank door. I know you're in there. I see the lights. <laughs> so I quietly turned off the lights. <laughs> thinking, he's not going to see that. And then I got on the floor. And I crawled. And I crawled. Listen, I had to use the manual remote because we didn't have remotes back then. Turn the TV set off. I crawled in my bedroom and I just sat there and I said, I'm not real sure. I went to church every Sunday. Not sure if I knew how to pray, but I sure prayed that night. 30 minutes felt like an eternity. And then all of a sudden it's quiet. I thought maybe he's gone. So I looked through, I crawled back in the, in, the, in the glass porch and I looked through the window and he's sitting on the steps. It took about 30 minutes and he finally left. Listen, when the Holy Spirit is knocking on your door, don't turn off the lights. 
Don't turn off the TV set. Don't pretend that you're not home. Just open up the door and let him come in. Amen. And so just just receive him because he he's he's he may he may bring something with you that feel like you are you've had a little bit too much to drink. Amen. But it's okay because it's a godly feeling. It's being filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. The second thing I believe we can make room for him is not to grieve his indwelling. Not to grieve him once he comes in. Now, well, the word grieve simply means to hurt, to offend, or to sadden. And how would we, how would we sadden the Holy Spirit? How would we grieve him? Well, first of all, we'd grieve him once we get born again, thinking that that's all there is. Just simply ignoring him, not welcome him in by receiving Jesus, but then begin to ignore him. Act like he's just not there. Act like he is not present. It's much as though you have a dinner party and you've invited some of your best friends to come and you've got this meal prepared for them and they're all eating, but you're sitting in the television, you're sitting in the in the in the TV room watching the football game. You know, it's like you're not, you, you, they're not there for you to entertain necessarily, but they're there for you to fellowship with them, to have some interaction with them. And so often we ask the Holy Spirit to come in, but in our quiet time, in our prayer time, we spend time on other things and uh, ignore His presence, ignore Him, and don't recognize that He wants to speak to us, He wants to direct us, He wants to guide us us. Uh, can I tell you another little story? Yeah. Back when uh, when Luke was just a little boy. Uh, Luke is my man now. He's he's 39 years old and he he he, he well he, he's a nice looking young man. But back in when he was just a little kid he was a little twerp. Uh, and, and you know he, he look at some of his pictures and say whoo how did he turn in to be something like he is? But anyway, uh, he would have his little friends come over. And, and there was, uh, I think it was, one was Zach. I don't know the, the name of his friends. Just in a neighborhood that we live in, right, right across the street here on Belmont. And the little neighbors would come in and they would, they would always bring their little brothers and they'd go in, the, in his bedroom and they'd play and we could hear the noise playing. And one, one afternoon, I got home a little early, they were, they were playing back there and I went in. Luke had crawled in his bed and gone to sleep. The little boy still playing with his toys. And I woke him up. I said, Luke, I said, you got friends over to play. He said, oh, I know. He said, they'll play when they're finished. They'll go home. <laughs> When the Holy Spirit comes in, He don't want you to be taking a nap and, and, and put stuff on His responsibility. So we grieve Him, we hurt Him, we offend Him by not entertaining Him. By, and I say entertain, and not so much entertainment, but have some commu communication with Him, some dialogue with Him, spending some time with Him, acknowledging that He's there. You realize that the Holy Spirit has come into your life life to be your helper and one of the ways that he is your helper is that he's going to bring with him uh, what's called the fruit of the spirit Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 23 rather uh, or, or 25 in that neighborhood it says that the fruit of the spirit love and peace and joy kindness patience long-suffering uh, temperance all of those things are fruit of the spirit listen he is coming in into your life so that you can walk in love better so that you can have more patience so you can have more peace so that you can have more joy listen when I grieve the Holy Spirit then I sadden him when I sadden him my joy level is going to go down but when the Holy Spirit's joyful, when I entertain Him, and when I communicate with Him, and I dialogue with Him, and I have some interaction with Him, my joy level is going to go up. And so it's all part of His responsibility and His job to help you grow in things. Now you realize the fruit of the Spirit are for you. 
they're, they're for you. It's, it's, it's part of the development of holiness in your life. Development of separation from the, uh, the way the world does things and the way the Spirit of God wants you to do things. And so when we entertain the Holy Spirit, when we interact with the Holy Spirit, then those fruit are going to grow. Listen, we ought to walk in more love today than when we first got born again. We ought to walk in more patience and more kindness and more gentleness than when we first got born again. Why? Because the fruit grows. And it's interesting that Paul used that word fruit instead of just manifestation. A manifestation is something that just happens. Fruit is something that grows. You know, and so it's important to understand the difference between the two. And so uh, there's four ways that we can grieve the Holy Spirit. John 16, 13 said, He is the Spirit of truth. He's the Spirit of truth. That simply means this, that if I fail to walk in the truth that I know, then I'm saddening the Holy Spirit. If I fail to walk in the truth that I know, well, what's the truth that I know? Well, if I find out that it's necessary for me to forgive someone who's offended me, and I say, I ain't going to forgive that old so-and-so, he don't know what he did to me, then I'm grieving the Holy Spirit. I'm not walking in that love that he wants me to walk in. When I find out that something is in the, in the Bible and, and I, I, I get it and I understand it and I refuse to walk in it, then I'm grieving the spirit of truth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, he said he is the spirit of faith. When I fail to walk in faith, when I fail to walk in uh, truth, but I fail to walk in faith and I allow fear to control me, allow doubt to control me, allow worry to control me, allow anxiety to control my life, then I'm not walking in that faith uh, and that if I'm not walking in faith, then I'm not going to be pleasing to God and I'm going to be grieving the Holy Spirit. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, he's called the Spirit of Grace. When I recognize that I can do things and I, I, I am qualified to do some things, I have talent, I have abilities, I have capacities, I am smart, I have a good education, but if I don't give that credit to God for putting those things in me, putting those abilities in me, putting that ability to learn, putting that ability to put two, two words together, then I am operating and I'm walking contrary. I'm taking the grace of God in vain. When I, when I choose to give Him all the glory for what God has done in my life. And I can say, listen, the Lord has done this for me. The Lord has equipped me. The Lord has done this. And I acknowledge that and give Him the credit that I'm walking in that spirit of humility and not in the spirit of pride. Because God resists the pride. You remember in... Uh, Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6 it said it's not by might it's not by power but by my spirit says the Lord you might say it this way it's not by education it's not and my education is good we ought to get all that we can it's not by ability we ought to enhance our abilities and learn and get better at what we do but it's not by that it's by the spirit enhancing those things on me and then the fourth way is the spirit of holiness Romans chapter 1 verse 4 we grieve him as the spirit of holiness when we walk outside of the parameters of the word we call it in our vernacular we call it sin missing the mark and it's imperative it's important that the Christian that believers recognize that we as humans can still miss it and that when I miss it and I refuse to repent of it I refuse to confess it I refuse to turn from it then I'm grieving the spirit of holiness you got to understand that sanctification, this separation, this holiness is always a prerequisite for anointed service. 
Listen, people can get involved in service all the time. But if they still have unrepented sin in their life, that anointing will not be as powerful. That service will not be as effective. And so sanctification, getting your sin washed away by the blood every time you miss it is a prerequisite for your anointing and the service to be an anointed service. Second Timothy, Paul says that we should be vessels of honor, uh, meat for the master's use. Amen. Ready for the master's use. I, I, this, the Lord had me say this last night. The born again person who doesn't obey, never yields, and walks in sin is unemployable in the realm of the Spirit. That's tough. As Dr. Jeff would say, it's tight, but it's right. The third, the, the, the third way we make room is that we should not quench the outflow of the Spirit. We don't resist His incoming, we don't grieve His infilling, and we don't quench the outflow. Well, what does that mean? Uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse uh, 6, uh, verse 18 rather, it says, do not quench the Spirit. The word quench in the Greek means to extinguish, to put out, or to drown out. Uh, we limit or extinguish the manifestations and demonstrations in the Spirit individually and corporately. In other words, when we relegate the Holy Spirit to a back room, when we relegate the Holy Spirit to only something that I do when I'm by myself, I pray when I'm by myself, when I don't allow the Spirit to walk and operate through me and speak through me and, 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 and pray for someone through me, then I quench that Holy Spirit, quench that move of the Spirit. And so when you first Corinthians chapter 12, Paul gives us what he calls the manifestations and demonstrations of the Spirit. The power gifts, the vocal gifts, and the revelation gifts. They should be in operation in the believer's lives. They should be in operation in our church. They should be in operation in every church. Uh, but when we relegate it to something else, we relegate it to another time, then we quench the move of the Holy Spirit. We dis extinguish the fire of what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. Now you realize that, you know, it's not necessarily that you're going to have these happen every day or every service. But it's important to make room for it, to be ready for it, to allow Him to move and to flow in our church service, but also in your life. Now how does that work in your life? There's some times when, have you ever been, you know, just minding your own business, you know, you're, you're watching some television or you're reading a book or you're driving and somebody's name comes up. You think of somebody you hadn't thought of in years. That's a prompting of the Holy Spirit. And they're going to want you, He wants you either to pray for that person or maybe even contact that person. Why? Because that person may need a word from you. I can't tell you how many times this has happened to me. When I'm just driving, just, just minding my own business and I, somebody's name comes up, their picture comes up. And I'll either give them a call or I'll send them a text. Say, just thinking about you, praying for you. Hope everything's okay. And then I'll get a text back. Oh, I'm glad to hear that somebody's praying for me. I'm going through this real difficult time. Some of that, some of might have happened to you uh, that I've, I've contacted and done that. Uh, but there's been so, not, not, uh, not all the time. So you'd say, well, I was going through this difficulty. Pastor never called me. Well, at that moment, the Holy Spirit hadn't quickened me. But you realize that there are some times when the Spirit of God isn't wanting, you know, it's not this big, uh, this big spectacular thing thing. See, sometimes a supernatural just seems to be so natural and so simple, like a phone call or a text or a contact. Uh, just a, a couple of days ago, Pastor B and I were uh, at a local grocery store, and, uh, uh, and I saw this lady in a wheelchair and uh, had a, a prosthetic uh, leg from the knee down didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it. Just, just notice that, well, she probably just got it because she's not walking on it. And uh, so I go down this aisle, and uh, just a couple of minutes later, 
she's right there. And she said, uh, Pastor Carl. And uh, you know, she's wearing a mask. And I, and I looked at her for a minute. And I called her name. And it's like, wow. And uh, it happens that she was part of our church 28, 29 years ago. And her son's with her. He's, he's 27 years old. And a fine looking young man. And so we got to visiting with him. And, and just welled up on the inside of me to pray, to pray for her. And so Pastor B and I prayed. And, and you know we visited for just a little bit. And I just felt such a connection there. And, and so gave him a business card. You know I don't know that they'll be back or not. I, I, that, that's not the important. But just be led by the Spirit. We, we didn't know we were necessarily going to be at that store. That day. At that time. And so sometimes, you know, you're just going by your natural uh, everyday business and something supernatural happens. And so you just have to be aware and be ready. Sometimes it's giving a, an encouraging word to somebody. You don't know that that may be the only encouragement that they've had all week. You don't know what they've been going through. But guess what? The Holy Spirit does. And it may be that it's important that you just say, listen, it doesn't matter if I'm in Walmart or Drug Emporium or wherever I am. Uh, when the Holy Spirit quickens you, go ahead and step out in faith and say, can I pray with you? And then just go ahead and, and, and pray with them. Why? We don't want to quench the Holy Spirit. I believe the less we quench Him, the more He's going to use us. The less we, we put Him uh, down and keep Him from flowing, the more He's going to operate in our life. Amen? 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, Paul is writing to Timothy and he said, Stir up the gift that's in you. How many of you, well, I, I don't know, I know, maybe the guys don't, but you, you cook gumbo. And, 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 you know, you let it set, because the longer it sets, the better it is. But then you go to get some gumbo, what do you do? You take that long ladle and you stir it up. Why? Because all the goodies have settled down. You stir it up and you get all the chicken and the sausage and whatever else you put in your gumbo. That's what I put in mine. And, and, uh, and the onions and the bell peppers. You stir it up. Why? Because you're going to get all of it. I believe we need to stay stirred up in the realm of the Spirit. Amen. So that the Holy Spirit can be operative and go in our life. Amen. The gifts, the manifestations, is what the Holy Spirit has placed in you so that you can minister to others. So that you can have a word of wisdom. You can have a word of knowledge. You can have an encouraging prophecy. You can lay hands on the sick and they'd recover. You can have a, a, a discernment and a hearing by the realm of the Spirit to know certain things and to be able to share. And I believe when we're connected with the Holy Spirit and we don't quench Him, that will flow more and more in our life. So we make time for Him. We make room for Him by not resisting Him his incoming, not uh, grieving his indwelling, and not quenching his outflow. Amen. And so this morning as we receive communion, when we receive communion, and the message isn't necessarily geared as a communion message, I always see that event, and I promote that event, as Jesus' commitment to the plan of God. That Jesus called his disciples and said, I want you to do this to remember me. I want you to do this to recognize that I am fulfilling God's plan for my life. And it becomes a commitment for us on our behalf 
to say, God, I want to fulfill your plan for my life. I want to allow the Holy Spirit to come in. I want to allow the Holy Spirit to dwell in me. I want to allow the Holy Spirit to flow through me and be used, and be used by the Holy Spirit. And this is our opportunity to commit to doing just that. Amen. And so if you need any help, if your fingers are a little bit stiff, uh, you might get someone next to you. You pull the little clear plastic off the top and expose the bread. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Brother Larry's going to get the kids. Okay. I, I, I forgot. Hallelujah. Praise your Lord Jesus. We'll give you an opportunity to get your communion elements. Those of you who want to receive. Now, here at Living Glory Church, we don't have any closed policy. We call it open communion, which simply means that if you're a member of the body of Christ, you can receive communion with us. If for some reason you're here this morning and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, you have not uh, allowed the Holy Spirit to come in and, and dwell in you and, and, and be born again where the Spirit connects with your spirit, then uh, I want to pray with you. Amen. If that's you this morning, you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, uh, would you lift your hands? Let me pray with you. I believe everybody here is, but let's just be sure. Anybody has never made Jesus the Lord of their life. We'll give you just a couple of minutes. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, praise the Lord. Glad that you are members of the body of Christ. Taking the children a little bit longer to get in. I guess I waited too long to tell them to go get them. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise your Father. Praise your Lord Jesus. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you. If there's an area, Father, in our lives where we have resisted, where we have grieved, or we have quenched the Holy Spirit, Father, I thank you that the Holy Spirit will reveal it to us right now. And as he does, Father, we'll confess it, we'll repent of it, and we'll, we'll get clean of it in the name of Jesus thank you Father thank you Father glory to your Lord Jesus thank you Lord Jesus as we take the bread from the little from the plastic break it between your finger and thumbs Jesus said this is my body and we know that this is a representative, a symbolic representation of the body of Jesus where the dynamic working of the Holy Spirit comes in and effectively does something in our life. And so for this morning's message, we recognize that when we take this, we're not resisting His infilling. We're not resisting, we're not going to quench his, in, his indwelling and we choose not to uh, quench the outflow not grieve his indwelling and quench the outflow and so Father as we take this and we've already prayed for healing but we thank you that Jesus' body was broken on our behalf so we don't have to carry sickness and disease in our bodies so we receive the healing and the anointing of the Holy Spirit to come into our life and effectively manufacture and manifest that healing in our bodies in Jesus' name. And he took the cup and he said, take this all of you, this is my blood that's been shed for you. We know that this is just grape juice those of you participating with us online, whatever juice you might be having. But at the same time, it's more, it's, it's a covenant commitment that Jesus made. He made a covenant with the Father on our behalf. And so for you and I, we take the cup and it's our, it's our commitment to the covenant. 
It's our commitment to be what God wants us to be. It's our commitment to flow and to follow the plan of God for our life. It's to allow the Holy Spirit to truly be our helper. And so as I take this, say this with me. Father, I choose not to resist His incoming. I choose not to grieve His indwelling. And I choose not to quench His outflow. Father, I need the Holy Spirit in my life. And as I take this cup, it is my symbolic nature, my symbol that I'm wanting Him to flow in my life and to commit my life to Your plan and He as my helper to help me flow in the name of Jesus. And so we take the cup. Praise you, Father. There's a little receptacle on the back. As you walk out, you can just drop it in that receptacle and that will work. Amen. Father, we thank you today for the working of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Father, we give you glory and honor to this morning. We worship you. We thank you, Holy Spirit. And we say you are welcome in this church. You're welcome, and, and point, point to yourself, you're welcome in this temple, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Anything else, Lord? Anything else this morning? Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, those of you watching by Facebook, thank you for being part of our service this morning. We'd love to see you in person. Those of you who are frequent us on Facebook, we'd love to see you Saturday night at 6, Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Those of you who are in the house, we're so glad to see you. Pastor B and I love you. We appreciate you. And uh, thank you for, for being here. I believe we're in between the rain cycles. So uh, I, I we'll just go ahead and dismiss you. Father, I thank you that you bless them that you keep them, that your face and your countenance always shine towards them. Father, that you would be gracious to them and give them peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So be blessed. I'm not sure what's going on back